Organización del cual es un miembro emérito eh, y que ya eh, tenemos, vamos en nuestra quinta congreso y el, 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 eh, la red de Aver iberoamericana de apego ya está bien consolidada, tiene presencia jurídica en Estados Unidos, eh, podemos aceptar, aceptar donaciones, etcétera, etcétera. De manera que ha sido realmente un trabajo eh, monumental a través de los años y creo que estamos bien parados económicamente para un futuro muy positivo. Eh, lo otro que, eh, que quería decir eh, es que eh, eh, el estudio de la Universidad de Minnesota de, de niños, eh, de los cuales va a hablar Alan, es eh, sin lugar a dudas eh, uno, eh, el principal confirmación de, de muchos de los conceptos de John Bowlby y Mary Ainsworth es sobre la importancia del vínculo de apego eh, durante el transcurso de la relación humana. Eh, ya este, Alan nos dirá más de eso. Eh, simplemente quiero decir, aunque Alan no quería que hablara mucho de él, que es profesor emérito eh, de el, de, de, del Instituto de Desarrollo Infantil de la Universidad de Minnesota, del cual fue director mucho tiempo, ha recibido muchos honores eméritos, por ejemplo, de la Universidad de Tejín en, 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 en Holanda, ha publicado ocho libros y tiene 140 publicaciones de artículos y capítulos. Bueno, sin más, Alan, it's all yours, go. Gracias, buenos días a todos. Lo que uh, voy a hablar en inglés porque uh, el tiempo está limitado. The, the first slide in my series, after the title, is a quote by Norma Rosen based on letters that were written between Freud and John Dewey. Both of these giant thinkers shared the same insight, which was that the human mind cannot separate itself from its own experience. I can only build upon that. The oldest hypothesis in all of psychology is that early experience has a profound effect on the development of the mind and the personality. Yet for decades, It was very difficult to verify this hypothesis. Then came Bowlby and his attachment theory. Because Bowlby recognized that the most crucial part of early experience was the confidence children acquire regarding the availability and responsiveness of those who care for them. And Bowlby's colleague, Mary Ainsworth, showed that this degree of confidence that infants have in their care could be measured. The next slide is, shows the themes for today, slide number three. Basically, what I want to do is describe a bit about the Minnesota study, which is how we set about verifying this hypothesis focusing on a special role for attachment. In addition, I want to discuss how it is that attachment has these profound effects on development. The next slide shows some of the challenges that one faces in trying to establish that early experiences of critical importance. Uh, a study can find a link between something measured early in childhood and some later outcome, but there are always many alternative explanations for such a finding. Uh, just list a few examples. First of all, how does one know that it is experience that is important as opposed to inborn characteristics of the infant? Perhaps it is the infant's characteristics that predict later development and personality. Or 
Or what about surrounding context, the stress and poverty that the family is experiencing? Could it be that the stress and poverty have direct effects on the child and it has nothing to do with the parenting they receive? How can we tell? And finally, the final example is that it might be that early experience is only coincidentally related to outcomes. It's possible that parents who treat children well in early childhood also do so later, and it's really later experience. So these are the challenges that we and anyone else would face. Now, if you're hearing me, we're on the slide showing the Minnesota study. Mauricio, nod your head. Alan, uh, we're not seeing the slides. Oh, you I thought you were showing them there. Well, uh, we, see, we see you, but we don't see the slides. No, I mean, I thought you, uh, Laura had my slides. I thought you were projecting them. You have to uh, put the three little points at the top of the screen. Of the, and uh, you share a screen. Yes, share a screen. Uh -oh. Okay, I'll, I'll do that. Now I have to, I'll have to open my, I'll have to open the slides. And click on share uh, screen again. Okay, let, let me get the slides open. Um, one, one moment. Sharing the screen, but I don't see the slides. Put share screen again. Whoops, no, wait a minute. Now, what is that I'm seeing? No. Uh, put the PowerPoint in your computer. The slides. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, one second. I'll, 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 I'll do. Uh, okay. okay. Now we see the slides. Okay. I'm going to just go where we were. Okay, now how do I get back to where I can see? Oh, you don't need to see me, do you? No. You can see the slides. We can see the slides. We're good. Just Someone tell me when you can't, if you can't see slides, and I'll just go on. Yeah, we, we can see the slides. Are we good? Good. Can you hear me still? We can hear you loud and clear. I'm not, I don't know if you can hear me. We, we can hear you loud and clear. Yes. We can hear you. Go ahead, we can hear you. No, 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 no. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, but now you can't see the slides. Co no. I can't hear you. Slides. <laughs> this is fun. Slides, yes, you know. I can't hear you, but you, you were able to hear me when you were seeing the slides? Then I'll just go back to the slides and talk. There. Okay. We okay. can see the slides. I'll talk without knowing whether there's anyone there. <laughs> yes, we are here. Okay, the way we solve these problems is, first of all, we studied a large group of children who were born in poverty. All of these children were poor. In this way, we relatively controlled for the effects of poverty. Second, we began our evaluations before the children were born. This let us assess the attitudes and expectations of parents 
in the absence of a child. And we study the children from the beginning of their life, starting in the first days of life, so that we could evaluate their inborn characteristics. We study them age by age. In this way, we were allowed to look at whether later experience was as important as early experience, and we found that even controlling for later experience, early experience still predicted outcomes. We had very comprehensive assessments of the children. This was quite important. So we studied their language development, their intelligence, their temperament, their peer relationships, all aspects of their development. This way, we were able to assess these qualities and evaluate whether they were important. As just one example, we found that early attachment and early care experiences success at school. We could know that it was experience that was important because we could control for the parent's intelligence and the child's intelligence and show that nonetheless, early experience predicted school outcomes. We did evaluate the stress and other circumstances of the family. And while these were important, we showed that attachment relationships nonetheless remained important when we took those into account. Okay. A few words about the attachment relationship. I'll be very brief here. I know we're way behind in time. Attachment refers to a relationship between babies and their parents. All babies become attached to those who care for them, even if they're maltreated. But the differences in attachments are differences in quality. We can measure these differences, and we know that they are based in the history of care. We observe these differences in quality by looking at the organization of the child's behavior with respect to the parent. Attachment develops over a series of phases and is consolidated in the second half year of life. There's no such thing as instant attachment, and the reason that our attachment assessments are so powerful is their summaries of all the experiences the child has with the caregiver throughout the first year of life. Okay, these are the four patterns of attachment. You will hear about them in this conference. I'm going to emphasize some general points about secure attachment in contrast to anxious attachment. I won't go into these further right here. What do we mean by being securely attached? We mean that the infant is confident in the availability and responsiveness of the caregiver. They're able to use the caregiver as a base of security, as a haven of safety, as a source of confidence that they can take with them wherever they go. Anxious attachments, in contrast, those infants who develop anxious attachments have doubt or uncertainty regarding the responsiveness of the caregiver sense of safety is not secured. Now, when we look at Ainsworth's strange situation, we're able to determine that children have a secure attachment by the way they use the caregiver as a secure base. That is, they move away from the caregiver to explore the toys in the room because they are confident that if some threat should arise, they can return to the caregiver and receive the comforting they need. They show a preference for the caregiver whenever they're threatened. They may play with strangers, they may be engaged with toys, but if something threatening occurs, they seek interaction or contact with the attachment figure. 
and this contact is effective. After the brief separations that we do in the laboratory, they are very active in seeking contact or interaction with the caregiver when they return. This also shows confidence in the relationship. They seek contact immediately because they know that when they have contact with the caregiver, things will be okay. They recover very quickly once they achieve this contact. Again, because the pattern of interaction has been so stable and reliable. Okay, now I want to say something about the major results of the Minnesota study. I'll only outline a few of these and then highlight how these connections were made. The first thing we found was that children with histories of secure attachment as infants had more self-confidence, higher self-esteem, and they viewed themselves as capable and effective in the environment. They believed they could face challenges. They believed they could be successful when they encountered problems. This confidence showed up in preschool, when they went off to elementary school and throughout their lives, there's higher self-confidence among those who have histories of secure attachment. Children with histories of secure attachment also showed greater self-regulation. They were able to adjust their behavior to the particular circumstances in which they found themselves. They could run and play with exuberance when on the playground, and yet sit quietly and pay attention to the teacher during story time. They also were able to tolerate frustration better, and they could sustain interaction with other children despite the challenges of doing so. They showed very high social competence, age by age, and we were able to establish close relationships with others. And we found this throughout the school years and on into adulthood when children with histories of secure attachment are more able to trust others and let themselves be emotionally vulnerable in relationships. I said previously they were more successful at school and they showed a relative absence of behavior and emotional problems. Finally, children with histories of secure attachment were more resilient. And they showed this in two ways that I'll elaborate later. One way they showed it is in the face of stress or adversity, they were able to continue functioning well. The other way they showed resilience was that if they did have a bit of difficulty in their lives, if they did for a time show behavior problems, they were more likely to recover from these and resume effective functioning. Okay, I'll move to the second major goal of this presentation, which is to talk about how attachment supports development. I've listed these five what I call bases or foundations that attachment provides. The first one is the motivational base. This refers to the basic sense of connection that children who have histories of secure attachment feel with regard to others. They feel a basic sense of belonging and connection. They have positive expectations concerning relationships. They expect relationships to be valuable and rewarding. So responsive care leads to the expectation that relationships will be valuable. This is what predicts the engagement with peers, the warm relationships, 
the trust, the capacity to be vulnerable. We assess these expectations in a number of ways over the course of our study, beginning in early childhood. From stories children told, from their drawings, from sentence completions, and from other narrative procedures. Okay, the second foundation I call the attitudinal base. This is very closely related to the base of motivation. But it has to do with the belief that one will be able to get what one needs from other people. You will have success in your relationship with others, and that means you will be able to turn to them in times of need. We were able to study this into adulthood. Those with histories of secure attachment are better able to receive, to seek and receive some support from their partners and are better able to provide support for their partners. The third base is the instrumental base. This has to do with being able to be comp competent in the object world. To enjoy playing and discovery to have an attitude of exploration, to seek experiences, to enjoy new experiences, to enjoy discovery. This all comes from the secure base that the caregiver provides in infancy. Being able to explore out from the caregiver provides the background for competence in, and effectiveness later. Okay, the fourth one is a very important one and very uh, current today. There's a great deal of emphasis in emotional regulation. And those with histories of secure attachment have a balanced emotional life. They're able to modulate their expressions of emotions to keep excitation or arousal in moderate levels, to recover after they've been overly aroused. Uh, one other point I would make here is very important. It's very clear that young infants cannot regulate their own emotions, but their emotions can be regulated with the help of a caregiver. And it's this training in emotional regulation in the context of care that allows children to later regulate their own emotions. Alan Shore, for example, has written about how this training in emotion regulation actually tunes excitation and inhibitory systems in the brain, leading to this ability to have balance in one's emotional life. Okay, finally, the final base I call a relational base. By being in an empathic relationship with a caregiver, children learn to respond to others with empathy. With empathy. One learns not just to be one receiving care, but one learns relationships work. Therefore, when you see another in distress, you automatically want to help them because this is what you've experienced. This is your understanding of relationships. You understand that relationships are reciprocal. There's a stark contrast here with those who have histories of avoidant attachment because when they see another in distress, their understanding of relationships leads them to do something that makes the distress even worse. We saw this many times in our preschool, for example, when a child would say, oh, my stomach hurts. A child with a history of avoidant attachment might come and poke them in the very spot that they were complaining about. Okay. Now, I'm being brief so that there might be some time for any questions. But before I finish, I want to say something about the way development works, the complexity of developments. 
of development. I've said previously that early experience shapes the individual's expectation. Experience leads to expectation perceptions. So, for example, um, having had these experiences of others being dependable and responsive to you, when our children went to the preschool, they expected the preschool teachers would be resources for them. So they would turn to the preschool teachers when they had a need or had anything that they wanted from the teacher. Okay, experiences influence expectations. But expectations subsequently influence experience. Children bring different views of the world as they go forward, and these affect how they behave. One of my favorite examples is that one day in our preschool, music was playing when the children arrived. So children began to dance around to the music. A little boy arrived and went up to a child and asked her to dance. She said no. He went off into a corner under a table and was very quiet and distressed, sulking, we would say, for some time. Meanwhile, another child came in and went up to that same little girl and asked her to dance. She said no. But he just skipped along to another child asked her to dance. She said yes, and they happily joined the others dancing. These two children saw that same event in very different ways. They, the one child saw it as a terrible rejection, as a blow to his self-esteem. The second child didn't. He didn't. He perhaps thought there was something wrong with that little girl or it was not that consequential. So he just went on. So expectations influence experience. These later experience will now deepen the expectations that both of those children have. Behavior is always the product of the entire history and the current circumstances. Nothing is lost. Now I'm going to emphasize this further when talking about continuity and change. We found in our study that when circumstances radically changed, the behavior of children changed. When children with secure histories encounter, encountered very difficult circumstances, their problems would increase. When those with anxious histories encountered more supportive circumstances, they got better. But even when change occurred, the past remains latent. It isn't erased. This is one of the things we showed in our studies of resilience. So we defined a group of children who consistently showed behavior problems between ages three and five years. So all of these children had behavior problems, but some of them had histories of secure attachment in infancy, while others had history of anxious attachment. Which children would more likely relinquish their problems when they were eight years old? We found that it was those who had histories of secure attachment. So even during the difficult circumstances, the history of secure attachment was not erased, but remained potentially available to them. We showed this many times over a number of years, and we showed it both ways. Children who had anxious attachments who for a while were doing well remained more vulnerable than children with secure attachments who were doing well. So early, early experience does persist following change. I've got just one more slide. This is a way of summing up what I've said. Att 
attachment gives form to later development by promoting confidence in oneself and in others, by the belief that you can impact the environment, by the capacity to retain positive expectations, and by the capacity to regulate emotions and function effectively. While there are many influences on development, and we show those in our study, we show that peers were important, we show that stress was important, we show that family circumstances were important, still nothing was more important than the early attachment experiences of the child. And now, if it is possible to hear each other, I will be happy to take questions. I don't know. Can you hear me at all?